There it is. is warming. The Arctic in particular is warming four times faster than the global average. We're seeing glaciers um, retreating faster than ever. One of the things that we were interested in studying are the impact of the thermal haline circulation on Svalbard. Surface ocean circulation um, travels across the tropical zone as it hits North America, forms what you, many people know as the Gulf Stream. And that Gulf Stream water is warm and it travels up the east coast and then, and then transits uh, eastward across the Atlantic Ocean. And as it does, it's cooling. It becomes denser, higher salinity, and therefore it sinks. So this conveyor belt, as you see in this uh, video, travels to the north, uh, up into uh, near Iceland and actually up along the Norwegian coast. And this warm water can actually impact the, the melting of the glaciers. And it reaches all the way up to Svalbard. This warm water was not in the fjords prior to 2005. So we had normal sea ice cover in the fjords. In the summer, the fjords would open up and we'd have this very cold uh, circumstances of the water column in front of the tidewater glaciers. But since 2005, there's so much heat coming from the North Atlantic water into the fjords that often the fjord does not freeze in the wintertime and it's causing much increased melt rates uh, at the tidewater phase. So we can measure how much of that water is reaching the glacier and get an index of how that is influencing the melt rates of these tidewater glaciers. So what we do in our research is to join with dozens of other scientists in mapping the temperature of the water column in front of the glaciers so that we can track the intensity of that warm water and the influx of that water um, against the ice sheet. And so from 2005, 2009, 11, and 14, I took groups of undergraduate students up to Kongsfjord so they could themselves experience and develop a science problem, make observations, and then decide what to measure and, and evaluate. My main role on the project was to operate the uh, bathymetry equipment and software. So um, we were looking at how much sediment was coming off the glacier. So as the glacier is melting, all of the sediment that it carried over the land ends up in the ocean where the glacier retreated and it can change the surface of the ocean floor quite uh, dramatically. The other thing that we did is that every year we were up there, the first four years, we always took a middle school teacher. I was accepted to a program called Polar Trek, which um, accepts a number of, of um, science teachers and scientists in doing polar research. And I, I hit the jackpot and got teamed up with, um, with Julie Brigham Gretti. These middle school teachers helped us communicate out to their students, to their school system, to their parents, what was happening in the Arctic. And they can, they can, they help me try to understand how to communicate better about what's happening with climate change. How do you make it relevant? to them. And I think I also try to convey to them that, you know, climate change is the most important issue that we face. But the little secret is you can have a lot of fun and go to some really interesting places if you get involved in the research, right? And so I sort of hope that I can hook them into like maybe being involved in this kind of research. And so we were really lucky in 2000 and 2021 funded by the National Geographic to go back and continue our work. And at the last minute, um, her drone operator had to pull out of the project. So she asked me if I would be interested in, in very quickly learning how to fly a drone. And so in less than a month, I learned how to fly a drone. I got my drone operator's license. It was a great experience just getting to work with three other scientists. It was cool because we all kind of took different roles just naturally. We also just became good friends. So we're taking a snapshot in the summer of what's going on in this fjord and what's happening on a daily basis at the ice margin. By tracking the retreat of the ice, we can see how dramatically and quickly the system is moving. So the instrument that we are using 
is called a CTD. CTD stands for uh, conductivity, temperature, and depth. The conductivity gives us a, an idea of the salinity of the water column, how salty it is. Looking for water that's five and six degrees in the fjord as opposed to three or four degrees tells us the difference between North Atlantic water and the local ambient water column uh, that we normally would see in the fjord. We went out every day on maybe like an 18-foot boat from a, from a town called Neolison, and we would go maybe anywhere from a kilometer to 100 meters from the glacier front, and the glacier was maybe 200 meters off the, from the ocean to the top. So just studying the glacier and being that close to the front of the wow. glacier is just kind of like, whoa. small when you're in this small boat and the big ice breaks off and then there's a huge wave even though you're still like a mile away from the glacier. Because you are small you you really have to um, be realistic about where you can go. Think of traveling in a boat through a margarita. Okay, That's really what it's like when you're up there in the ice going very slowly. You've got all this ice that's just fallen off the glacier. It breaks up into the and we're going around trying to study what's happening in this environment that's a little bit difficult and challenging. If you have a much larger ship, you have a little bit more degrees of freedom. But the problem with the larger ships that do come into the fjord, they come in for a day and then they go out and they've got one snapshot of information. The thing that we really like is being there in a small boat day after day after day, observing the same areas and then being able to make observations about the ocean currents, what's happening on a daily basis. In the summer it's actually quite pleasant. Uh, a nice day will be about you know 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So not too bad, can be up to 60, but 45 to, to 55 degrees Fahrenheit is pretty normal. So there's a permanent research base there that is, you know, we were lucky, we weren't, we weren't roughing it. You know, it's comfortable, you know, we stayed in sort of a dormitory style accommodations. It felt like being somewhere in Scandinavia or in Iceland sort of, um, but a little more on edge because of the polar bears there. You're not supposed to go anywhere without a gun, and there are polar bear signs everywhere. Because polar bears are predatory, and they will, they will at times attack people. So you need to be able to defend yourself. So that's a that's a hard and fast law that you need to have a, a rifle. And the other thing is, while we're in working in boats on this really frigid, uh, cold water that's uh, can only be maybe five or six degrees or even colder. Um, you're, you're basically sitting on a refrigerator in your boat. <laughs> it's cold. So we wear uh, one-piece jumpsuits that are uh, literally survival suits so that if we happen to fall in the water, unlikely, um, we can survive. So you can wear a lot of clothing underneath these one-piece uh, survival suits that, are, that uh, are provided by the Norse Polar Institute. Sometimes there are days when it was particularly cold and maybe raining or snowing and, and a bit wet. Um, but you're always coming, you know, you're coming back to a hot meal and a, and a heated room and a bed. The weather is going to change on an hourly basis. Um, and so you do what you can in the time you have. And luckily it's 24 hour daylight in the summer, so you can literally work till you drop. I think the hardest part is preparing for every possible scenario that could play out before you get there. And inevitably something will happen that you didn't anticipate and you have to come up with some solution with what you have. You know, you could call tech support, which we did, but it's, you know, you're you know, it's almost like being on the moon, right? You know, you, you, you can't get materials sent in very easily. I mean, you could, but you don't really have the time. And so, so you have to make do um, with what you have. Lots of challenges there, but we never gave up. And that's one thing I really loved about this team is they were let's get it done type of people. The biggest thing when overcoming challenges on this trip was number one, to, to keep an open mindset and two, just to be patient. I think as a student you often think there will be somebody else here that will know how to do this and the truth is that there are a lot of situations that you just can't plan for and nobody has experience in that specific situation. You just have to be confident in yourself and trust that the solution you came up with is a good one.
For example, um, Mark became very good at driving our drone, but we had to time the drone flights so they didn't in interfere with commercial flights coming in and out of the, out of the research station. We were interested in studying um, how these um, subglacial um, streams, really, or rivers, kind of flow out from under the glacier. Um, we call them upwelling plumes, and get a sense of the velocity of the, of the water as it comes off the glacier face and out into the fjord, um, and how that was changing over the few weeks, and then maybe looking back as well. And the velocity meter that we had just wasn't it wasn't going to work in that environment, and we realized that pretty quickly. So Julie decided to use an old-fashioned technique called a drogue, which was essentially a buoy with a, like a, like a, almost like a sail attached to it. Ready, set, go. What's our GPS? 135. It's, oh, shit. 53. 53042. Um, and you drop this thing in the water, and the water pulls this kind of sail along. and. Um, and you just get point A, point B, and you get a straight line velocity measurement. Not as, um, you know, not the kind of resolution we would have gotten with, a, um, with what's, some other kind of device, but, um, you know, we got some data. So I thought that was a great sort of clever adaptation to, to what was going on there. So every day was an adventure to see, get it down in the fjord, to see what's happening, and to decide where we're gonna work, depending upon where the ice was sitting, and what the weather was doing that particular day. These subglacial jets, they come out, it, the water rises up the front of the ice and then it comes out laterally. When that fresh water comes up, the little saltwater krill that are in the water column, they get a little bit of toxic shock and they, they become immobile and they rise to the surface and the birds pick them off. So we could tell where the subglacial jets were coming up to the surface because the birds uh, the different seabirds were uh, nucleating around those plumes and picking off the krill. So we learn to look for the birds first, to be able to tell which part of the plumbing system was operating on a particular day. These glaciers are so dynamic and, you know, it would be virtually impossible to get to some of those locations, even if we had, you know, expensive mountaineering equipment. Um, and we certainly aren't trained with that anyway. So to get the drone into, like, into some of these crevasses, and um, I felt like it was a real gift to be able to, you know, to, to get that, to get, to see a glacier up close and personal um, and that level was really remarkable. So it occurs to me right here, Right in this very spot on the, on the rock face is exactly where the glacier was 10 years ago. And it's, it's just really striking to be right here and look back over a mile to where the face of the glacier is right now and realize that's how much ice we've lost in 10 years. It's, it's, I mean, I'm kind of speechless thinking about just how much ice that is, how much that represents. And this is just a small piece of all of the ice that is being lost worldwide. Svalbard continues to warm faster than any other part of the Arctic. And so we're seeing really the, the complete transition of a major ecosystem. We've been able to make measurements of the same glacier front over many different years and really contribute information to um, the causes, what are causing the ice to retreat, and particularly the effects of, the, of warmer water in the fjords uh, that is impacting Svalbard and increasing these melt rates. The data we've collected will be shared with dozens of other scientists who also have similar data in other times of the year so they can look at the whole ecological change that's happening, not only with what's happening with the ice, but what's happening with the local uh, ecosystems that survive uh, in these um, fjords and using and making use of the, the landscape that's now uh, newly emergent there. So we hope what we've done is to share with uh, the general public who don't have the opportunity to, to go to places like this why what's happening in the Arctic is so important to us here in the lower latitudes because what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. In fact, what's happening at the high latitudes will in fact impact the entire globe. And it's important for that message to get out so we can be more mindful and urgent with our attempts to control and decrease the rates of climate change.